Hello everybody, welcome back. Here we are in our second multiple linear regression problem. So as you might come to expect now, as we've gone through a few regression problems from module 14, module 15 now, there's a lot to these problems. When you're given a partial output like this, it can be daunting to figure out where do I start? And that's why practice, practice, practice is so important. Different problems that your instructor might give you will give you different starting points and you'll have a perhaps entirely unique path from where it starts to where you're finally completed. Sometimes you'll be given a lot of information. This one looks like it's got a fair bit. Others, the previous one that we did and uh, the first problem, we didn't have a lot to go on. And so it can be difficult to know where to start and what are you supposed to do. <laughs> so what I always do, again, I start in the regression statistics. I start at the top and I go through line by line. Can I get this one? No. Can I get this one? No. And go through until you see something that you can get. Fill it in. And then don't move on yet. Fill in what you can get and then see, okay, now with that information, does that help me with anything that I've already passed? Can I go back now and get something else? Does it, what does this help me with? So I've already gone through um, the first exercise. I talked quite a bit. Let's go through this one, or maybe we'll go a little bit faster and see how we go. So the following estimated regression equation states that wheat yield in pounds, so remember I've got our units of measurement here, is a function of, is a typos, is a function of the average monthly rainfall in inches, the density of speed dispersion, so when we're dumping the seeds out, there's are lots of seeds or a little bit of seeds, and seeds per square inch, and average daily temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. So we have temperature is given in T, and an index measuring the quality of fertilizer. Okay, so we've got a few things here. I have rain, I have seeds, I have temperature, and I have quality of fertilizer. All of these together, I have some reason to believe influence wheat yield, how much wheat I'm going to get uh, out of my labs. You know, it kind of makes sense, right? We can look at these variables and say, okay, yeah, that sounds about right. Makes sense to start that model with that a priori, that prior belief. So we get our data, we put that into our software, and again, in these multiple linear regression problems, I never give the data because to, to calculate values from the data set requires matrix algebra, which for my course is not a prerequisite, and so we don't go through any of that. We focus on understanding the output and reading the output. So that's my regression equation. Here's our partial estimated regression results. So we'll go through this in a similar way as we did uh, for the first problem, okay? So write the estimated regression equation. Well, okay, let's fill this out first. Starting in regression statistics, multiple R. Can I get it? Yes, because I have the R squared. The multiple R is the square root of the R squared. So I'll take the square root of 0.92, and there I have 0.96. So that gives me a measure of a linear association between my dependent variable and my independent variables. So fairly strong linear association. I have the R squared, I have the adjusted R squared, standard error. Well, I can't get standard error yet, I'm close but I can't get standard error yet. Observations. Now, how can I get observations if I'm not given really anything about the data set itself? So that might be a little bit of a blah, 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 blah. That might be a little bit of a puzzle. How can I get observations? Well, if I'm not sure, I'm gonna skip on and see if there's something that might spark that, that light bulb that might come back. Let's go down into the ANOVA. 
Well, here I need degrees of freedom. And I know degrees of freedom on regression. I know this is k minus 1. Okay, so I can do that because I have my regression equation. I can see that I have 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 coefficients that we're estimating. k is 5. If k is 5, 5 minus 1 is 4. Well, now, on error, well, error is n minus k. Again, I need the number of observations, n. Well, there's a couple of ways maybe that I could figure this out. One is that I do have 29 degrees of freedom total. And remember, I have two ways of calculating that 29. One of them is n minus 1. The other one is that it's the sum of everything above it. So if 29 is equal to something plus 4, well then that something must be 25. So there, now I know what my sample size is. Because n minus 1 is 29, it means that n must be 30. And here, if this is equal to 25, and I know that k is equal to 5, well, n must be 30. So I've got my number of observations. So there we have it. Again, it's kind of a puzzle at first, but then as we go through, keep in mind, you know, what is it we skipped over and can I get back up to it? Now filling out the ANOVA should be no problem because we've gone through a number of these, module 14 and module 13. We had a number of ANOVAs there as well. So let's see what we can do here. I've got an F statistic and I've got SSE. Well, with SSE and its degrees of freedom, I can get MSE. So let's do that, 272, 956.16, divided by its degrees of freedom, 25. So that gives me a mean squared error of 10, 918.25. Okay, well, what about SSR? What about MSR? Well, now that I have MSE, I know that relationship between the F statistic in MSE and MSR. Now I can just go backwards. So that F statistic is 70.24 multiplied by MSE, 10918.25. That gives me MSR. So this is 70, 766, 8, 97.88 and now I can get SSR because I have MSR degrees of freedom I know that MSR is equal to SSR over its degrees of freedom so I just want to solve for SSR so this is going to be large I'm going to take MSR multiplied by degrees of freedom and I have 3 million, oops, 3,067,591.52. And now I can get SST. Add that 272,956.16. SST I have is 3,340. Five four seven sixty eight, and there's our complete ANOVA. Okay, good. I just noticed we actually had another way that we might have calculated our SSR. Oh, maybe not. Maybe it wouldn't have worked. I'm just thinking here because we also have our R squared, and the R squared we know is SSR over SST. But that's also equal to 1 minus SSE over SST. So, yeah, we could have, because if our R squared is 0.92, which was given to us, 1 minus 
SSE, which we had given to us, SSE was 272.956.16. So we could have actually solved that a different way. So again, there might often be more than one way, more than one path to get to that final, uh, that final answer. Okay, so we've got everything in the ANOVA, we're good. Oh, we still have to go back here. Now we can get that standard error because we have MSE. The standard error is the square root of MSE. So if I take the square root of 10918.25, that gives me my, M, uh, my standard error is 104.49. Good. Uh, what are we doing? There we go. Okay. So we've got our regression statistics done. We have our ANOVA done. Let's come down now into our estimated regression equation output. These are all very similar types of calculations. If you went through the first exercise in module 15, these are all just small little variations of those exercises. So when I'm looking at the intercept, I have a coefficient and I have a lower limit on that interval. Well, don't forget how these are all obtained. Those intervals are the coefficient plus minus t alpha divided by 2 with n minus k degrees of freedom times those standard errors. So here, and this is the same for all of those intervals. They will all have that same critical t. So these are all at 95%, which means that alpha divided by 2 is 0 0.025, and n minus k, if I come up here, is 25. So there's my critical t. Now let's see if I have my t distributions here. There we go. So 25 degrees of freedom, alpha divided by 2, let's come down here, 2.06 is that critical T. Two point zero six. So how can I use that? Well, if I take this lower limit, 735, well that 735.36 is equal to the point estimate, 1056.63. It's the lower limit, so it's going to be minus 2.06 times the standard error, which is what we're trying to solve for. So I just rearrange that, 735.36 minus 1056.63 divided by 2.06, and I have a standard error of 155.96. Good, now I'm gonna get my t-statistic. That's the same relationship as always as well. That point estimate divided by its standard error, 1056. 0.63 divided by 155.96, and that's a relatively large t statistic of 6.78. Good. Oh, I need my upper limit. There's a couple of ways again, right? I now know the size of the margin of error, right? Between 1056.63 and that lower limit is 735.36. So using that margin of error, well, I just add that because this distance is exactly the same as this. So 1056.63 minus 735.36. So that margin of error is 321.27. So if I just add that to the point estimate, I have 
And so there's my upper limit. I could have also used this formula to get the upper limit. And again, I've got two different ways. You can choose whichever one you find is faster, easier for you. Okay, now I'm looking at the next one. The next one, a couple of different ways. This one is actually a simplified version of the first one because here I can see it's actually giving me that t-stat. We had to solve for the t-stat last time. This time I have it. So I'm going to solve for that standard error. I could use that upper limit and use a similar approach as what we just did for the intercept. But let's use this relationship here. Maybe it's a little bit easier, fewer calculations, because here I have that the test statistic is 0.86, and that's equal to 32.29 over that standard error. So if I just take 32.29, divide it by 0.86, well, that gives me a standard error of 37.55. Good. Now, for that lower limit, again, it's really the same calculation as what we just did here. Let's clean up some of this. I have a point estimate. 32.29. I have this upper limit of 109.42. And so that gives me a margin of error of 77.13, which means this must also be 77.13. So 32.29 minus 77.13 negative 44.84. Good. And notice that I do have a little bit of a, a checkup because I know that there's a relationship between the intervals and those p-values, right? The intervals and the test. Here, this is a, an obvious rejection which means that my hypothesized value, which for all those tests on individual parameter significance, all of those tests, that hypothesized value is zero, right? Let's not forget these tests. We'll talk more about these in a separate discussion when we get down here. But that p-value of zero means that we're going to reject, right? So when we look at the p-value, we mean we, we find that the coefficient is statistically different from zero. And of course, that's consistent with that interval. Zero does not exist within that interval. So that those two results are consistent. This one here, where I see I have a negative lower limit and a positive upper limit, well, zero exists within that interval. So without looking at the p-value, do we reject or not? Well, if zero exists within my interval, I better not be rejecting because my hypothesized value is in that interval. And there you go, I have a huge p-value. So there I've got some consistency. If you had gone through this exercise and you had a positive lower limit, meaning that zero was not in your interval, well, then you would hopefully see there's an inconsistency there. And, ah, I gotta go back and figure out what I've done. Okay, let's move forward. The next one. The next one I see I have both limits of my interval. I have no coefficient. Well, as we know, that coefficient for all intervals, the point estimate is exactly in the middle of that interval. So all I need to do is find exactly the middle of that interval, so 2.32 plus 11.62 divided by two, and that gives me the middle of that interval is 6.74. Now I have a t-stat, now I have a co uh, what do I have, a coefficient, and I have a t-stat. I can use this relationship here again, knowing how those three variables are related, 
and I have that 3.14 is equal to 6.74 over the standard error. So 674 divided by 314 gives me my standard error of 2.15. Good, we're getting there. Next line on fertilizer. I have a coefficient, standard error, T statistic, don't have to do anything there. I just need those lower and upper limits. So for that one, I kind of have to use this calculation. So here I'm going to have, let's clear away this nonsense. So I have my point estimate there is 1547 plus minus still the same critical T, 2.06 times that standard error, which is 2.38. Okay, so there's my interval, 1547, 1547 plus 2.06 times 238 gives me an upper limit of 20.37. And 1547 minus that margin of error, which is 2.06 times 238, 1057. And there we go. And last but not least, now I have a coefficient and I have my, my interval. I'm missing my standard error and my t-statistic. So what I need here, I need to get that standard error first because I can't get the test statistic, the t-stat, without the standard error. So I'm going to be using, again, this same relationship. Let me clean this up again. Where I know if I take, I can take either the lower limit or the upper limit. I prefer positive numbers, so I'm going to work with the upper limit. That upper limit, 46.39, that came from that point estimate, 9.06 plus, because I'm working with the upper limit, so it's the plus 2.06 times the standard error. So I'm gonna solve for that standard error. 46.39, plus 9.06 divided by 2.06. That gives me a large standard error, 26.92. And now I can get my T statistic again using this formula here. 9.06 divided by 26.92. I already know, I haven't hit equals yet, I already know with that big p-value, and of course this interval that crosses zero, this test statistic, is going to be close to zero. It's, it's, I know it's going to be less than one, just looking at nine divided by 26, but for consistency, again, there are little clues. Three, oops, three, four. Because if, if I did something here, if I did a calculation, whatever I got for my standard error, and then I have a test statistic, I don't know, it's 7.21, I'm just making up a number. Well, that is not consistent with that large p-value. And I know that even without looking at my t-tables, because by now you guys have enough experience working with those t-tables, you would know that a big t-stat like that would be way out in the tails, which would be a very small p-value. So I would be able to spot little inconsistencies just by looking at all of the information that is there. Now, yes, this should be a negative. Doesn't really make a difference, any significant difference, but I'll put it there just for completeness. Okay. That's it. We have completed our full table. That should be enough for this video. I'll come back 
momentarily and start another video to go through a few more of these problems. And maybe a separate video for that last part E, where I'm going to give a little bit more information about what's happening here. Um, that's not necessarily discussed in the workbook itself. So we might have two more videos on this problem. Hopefully they're helpful. Thank you guys so much for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.